Welcome uh, to week two of New Testament introduction. I hope uh, your studies are coming along okay and uh, you're doing the reading uh, and beginning to do uh, the class work that we have ahead of us in the coming weeks. Of course, the discussion board is every week, and uh, thank you for participating in that. Uh, it's a vital part of, of our learning. Also, as you move into the notebook and the uh, interpretive exercises, We'll have all of the interpretive exercises up within a day or so uh, from now. But, um, but anyway, I wanted to take this short video uh, just to hopefully help you uh, in your studies. Uh, we are uh, in week two, and uh, this is a part of what uh, is called Module 1. Module 1 uh, is the New Testament in context. Uh, we'll move beyond that and go into the Gospels and Paul's uh, writings and and other parts of the New Testament, for, but for right now, it's the New Testament in context. So let's talk about that for just a few moments, and I hope, again, that this, this short video will be an, an assistance and a help to you uh, in your studies. Uh, let me back up for a moment and, and talk a moment about the nature of this course, New Testament Introduction. Uh, this is a graduate course. The undergraduate uh, course in uh, New Testament would be New Testament survey. So what's the difference between a survey and an introduction? The survey would be uh, essentially aimed at uh, giving you uh, vocabulary from which to be able uh, to learn about the New Testament. It uh, truly is a survey. It's an overview. And so uh, we're not able to go very deep because you have to cover a lot of territory uh, in a relatively short period of time. Well, what's the difference in a survey then an introduction. In the introduction, we are actually trying to get beyond just the grammar and the vocabulary and to begin to figure out the logic uh, uh, and to truly study and dig into the New Testament. So in that sense, uh, the introduction to what? Introduction to the New Testament, but it's an introduction to the study of the New Testament. And I trust that that will develop into a lifelong endeavor, and we would call that, in the, uh, in, a, in another sense, the exegesis of Scripture. Uh, we're not simply wanting to know what it's about. We want to now figure out meaning, and that, in another word, would be exegesis of Scripture. So you're going to find that, particularly in De Silva's book throughout the book, that the aim is to equip you with tools for the exegesis or the understanding, the reading out of uh, the meaning of Scripture. In that sense, uh, what does New Testament in context mean? And uh, Module 1, two different weeks, is broken into four different parts. There's the hermeneutical and canonical, which was last week. This week is the historical and cultural. So let's just break those down just a little bit further. Uh, before I, I do so, I'd like to read a scripture. Uh, that puts this in context, and I'm reading out of the New King James, uh, 2 Corinthians chapter 11, verses uh, 1 through 4, uh, and uh, this is what Paul writes, Oh, that you would bear with me in a little folly, and indeed you do bear with me. For I am jealous for you with a godly jealousy, for I have betrothed you to one husband that I may present to you present you as a chaste virgin to Christ. But I fear, lest somehow, as the serpent deceived Eve by his craftiness, so your minds may be corrupted from the simplicity that is in Christ. Uh, for if he who comes preaches another Jesus, whom we have not preached, or if you receive a different spirit, uh, which you have not received, or a different gospel, which you have not accepted, you may well put up with it. Uh, in other words, he's giving a warning here uh, about being seduced or being uh, corrupted from the simplicity that is in Christ. Uh, so what does that have to do with the New Testament in context? These areas, hermeneutical and canonical uh, particularly, but historical and cultural also, are areas uh, in which we need to be careful uh, because uh, these are uh, territories in which we are endeavoring to intellectually uh, grapple with uh, the context of the New Testament. And many uh, have uh, been seduced away from the simplicity 
that is in Christ as a result of that, uh, let's talk about what we're talking about here. Let's, let's, let's delve into it further. Hermeneutically, what are we talking about when we talk about the hermeneutical context of the New Testament? And uh, there are four areas particularly that uh, we should address immediately. When we talk about the hermeneutical context, we're talking about criticism, both lower criticism and higher criticism of the New Testament. Now, those of us who love the Bible and we love ministry and we love uh, the, the things of God uh, may uh, draw back immediately with words of criticism and uh, matters like that. Why would we criticize the Scripture? When we say criticize, we're not talking about find fault in. We're talking about uh, being able to grapple with and uh, analyze uh, in a discriminating way. Uh, so when we talk about criticism, we, we delve into deeper questions. There are four of them particularly that present themselves to us immediately. And uh, you'll find these and you'll have exercises in this respect. Uh, they are in your textbook. Uh, what four are those? First, textual criticism, then form criticism, source criticism, and redaction criticism. Uh, I'm going to give you a quick definition of those and you can read these in your book. But text criticism deals with finding out what the original Greek in respect to the New Testament actually says. And so this may blow some people away, but we have what's called textual variance. You have an exercise in this, uh, an interpretive exercise in this, and it's going to cause you to dig. But uh, what do we mean by textual variant? And what we mean is that we, have, we do not have the actual original documents that we can say with assurance that Paul or Luke or John actually put uh, pen to paper, if you will, uh, and wrote. We don't have the originals. What we have is copies. Uh, and so we look for the earliest copies and when we find those early, early copies, the earliest that we can find, we at times find that there are variations. What is the significance of that? And this is something you're going to have to grapple with. Uh, form criticism has to do with the forms in which the New Testament has arrived to us. What is a form? Well, the earliest form, obviously, uh, is what we would call oral tradition. Uh, in all documents of the New Testament, uh, we have dating processes. So we ask, when were Paul's letters written? Uh, when were John's letters written? And when were the Gospels written? And we find that in uh, most cases, in all cases virtually, they were written some years after the life of Christ. So what took place in the time between the life of Jesus, the actual life of Jesus, and the writing down of the Gospels? The simple, uh, or I should say simplistic answer to that would be that uh, each uh, individual evangelist sat down and just remembered I just remembered what he independently remembered about the story. And then we, uh, but we find out that that's not always what happened because there were, there were stories that were carried down by memory. Uh, people just simply memorized the stories, they carried them down, and those began to be compiled uh, into what we have as the New Testament. And form criticism seeks to find the form, whether it be oral tradition or what's called pericopes, that came to us ultimately ending up in the writing of the Gospels. The third is source criticism, which uh, hitchhikes off of form criticism because when we find, particularly in the synoptics, but even beyond that, uh, that certain stories are retold in similar fashion, then we ask, is this just simply a miracle that different authors uh, Matthew and Luke, for example, just happened to write almost identically the same words, or did they have a source, source criticism, that they drew off of? These, this is, again, critical analysis of the Scripture. Redaction criticism uh, is, is the fourth that I introduced to you today, or talk to you about. And redaction says, what theology, what message did Matthew, Mark, Luke, or John 
use in their selection of stories. What message were they, what theology were they trying to say? For example, uh, in the, the case of Luke, Luke has a certain, being the only Gentile author of the Gospels, he has a certain interest uh, in the spread of the gospel beyond Israel. So you'll find that as a theological trend through Luke. He has an interest in the Holy Spirit, not that the others do not, but he has an interest that is uh, at a different level and he has a different approach to it. So redaction criticism then says, what is the message behind uh, the editorial work of the author? This is uh, criticism. Now, I read you the scripture about uh, not being seduced from the simplicity that's in Christ. Let me give you an example of that. We have uh, one of the foremost uh, biblical, critical scholars in the United States, textual critic, uh, by the name of Bart Ehrman. He teaches at um, University of North Carolina at Chapel Hill in the Biblical Studies Department, as a matter of fact. He began as a born-again Christian, an evangelical Christian, Moody Bible Institute, uh, Wheaton College, so forth. Uh, he then delved in, he's a textual variant expert. Uh, and today uh, he is one of the major proponents of uh, what would be called Gnostic Christianity, and he actually uh, has descended to the level of being an agnostic, and uh, he, um, there's a whole story behind that. Uh, but once again, seduced from the simplicity of a simple faith in Christ. And so uh, I simply give you that uh, as a forewarning. Stay fresh in your faith uh, as you find things that might cause you uh, to move beyond uh, what might be uh, simply called uh, faith in Christ. Uh, so that's hermeneutical. The four areas of context, let me move quickly to the other three. Canonical, and our text books do not deal a lot with uh, the canonization of Scripture, the canonical process. Uh, I believe page 35 in De Silva deals with that. Patia barely touches on it. Why, how did we come about selecting the 27 books that are the New Testament? What process took place in the early church, and do we agree with that? Apostolicity or apostolic origin or apostolic association is key. Then, of course, there's Catholicity, which is the universal acceptance that took place in the early church. We can't participate in that because, obviously, we're just observing what the early uh, church fathers did. Consistency is the third criteria, which means that it is consistent with the other books that we find to be, was well, consistent with the entirety of Scripture, both Old Testament and and new, but uh, there's a consistency not contradictory. Uh, last, um, and interestingly, perhaps least uh, important in the canonical process, uh, is inspiration. And we would say that the hand of God, the inspiration of God, the touch of God, uh, what uh, some have called the indicia, the indicator, the, the indication that this is the Word of God, uh, is there. Uh, so, the canonicity, the canonical context of the New Testament. Uh, the other two, historical and cultural, which are this week. Once again, this is an uh, exciting study because what is the historical context of the New Testament? And there's no end to this study. And we're talking about the flow of history through Israel. That includes the, the changes that were happening in the world of that day uh, as uh, the world is changing, Israel is changing, the flow of history surrounding uh, the uh, what's called the silent years, the 400 or so years of silence between the Old Testament and the New Testament. What took place there? Uh, the Maccabees and the Maccabean Revolt and the Hasmonean Dynasty, all of those things are important to the understanding of the context of the New Testament. In addition, as we move into uh, the study of the New Testament and New Testament times, what cultural factors were involved? And so you look at the culture or the philosophical uh, and religious environment that Jesus faced, and for Paul particularly as he moved out into the Gentile world. 
Uh, there is no end uh, to the studies of such things. And as you study these things, and as you know these things, you become a better student of the New Testament, better able to do exegesis, better able to explain exactly what the text means. When we talk about various things that may seem obscure to us, head coverings, things of that sort, uh, dietary laws and are they applicable, are they not, Sabbath keeping, all those things. We must know uh, the context of the New Testament in their day, what it meant in, at their time, if we're going to find out what it means in our time. God bless you as you study. Uh, I look forward to the rest of this course. We're going to enjoy studying together. God bless you. If you need any help from me, please let me know. God bless.